Okay. Sorry for the delay there. So this is Biostatistics Bio 610, just in case anybody was wondering if they were in the correct spot. I put a couple extra copies of the syllabus here at the front, just a couple. It's on Sakai, and I didn't want to kill too many trees. And I'll go over the syllabus very quickly just to illustrate a few of the high points that this is basically an introductory statistics class aimed at bench science students, typically master's, PhD students. It was it started a couple of years ago. The story behind it is once upon a time there was only Biostatistics 600 and a lot of people in the biomedical PhD and programs were complaining that that class was really public health focused so we tried to create this new class that's a little more relevant for bench science peoples. It's still pretty similar to 600 but it covers more bench science type applications. It also goes a bit more quickly and covers a bit more advanced material, which I guess is either plus or minus, depending on your point of view. And in particular, to mention looking at this year's enrollment, we've got several undergraduates signed up this year, which we haven't had in the past. And as far as I'm concerned, you are 100% welcome to be here. In fact, it makes me happy that, number one, people find my class interesting, and number two, they ask me about my enrollment every year, and they're happier when my numbers are high. So, I'm not trying to scare you away, but I mean, I also thought I should let you know that it is probably a bit more work and covers advanced material than 600 or some of the other elementary statistics classes. If you're thinking of going to grad school and want to impress people or just want to learn the material, you're welcome to be here. But if you just want to learn elementary statistics with the minimal amount of pain, there may be easier classes out there, just in the interest of full disclosure. We've got one TA for the class at the moment. I'm going to go up to the biostatistics department and plead my case for a second one after the class today. We'll see what happens. She's not here today. She'll probably at least come wave high on Friday. She will be teaching the discussion section and also holding office hours. As far as textbooks go, there's three different books, all of which I made optional because honestly, I have yet to find a book that I'm totally happy with for this class. Basically, like the Samuels and Whitmer book is intended to be an introductory class, but it just doesn't cover a lot of the material that I want to cover in here. This Van Bell book does a bit better, but it's not intended to be an introductory class textbook. It gets quite advanced with some complicated math pretty quickly. So I put them down there as a couple copies in the bookstore if anybody wants a reference for any of these things. But for the most part, I just teach out of the lecture notes. And historically, most people have just the lecture notes without any of the textbooks. And for what it's worth, I believe the Van Bell book is available online through UNC libraries if you want to be able to look it up as a reference without actually having to spend the money to get at it. And there's a list of topics in the course there. I also sent around a link to a survey last night. If there's anything in particular that's not on the list that you do in your lab work or what that you want to learn more about, then please indicate that on the course survey or just send me an email and let me know. The last couple weeks of this course, I just kind of cover a couple special topics briefly, and I try to tailor it to the interests of the class. We've done principal components analysis in the past. Last year, I did some nonlinear curve fitting that apparently is useful in some toxicology applications, and I'm very happy to do some of that again next year. Um, as for prerequisites, as it says, if basically the math level of math in this class is not going to be sophisticated at all as long as you're not a sort of person that goes into cardiac arrest when you see an equation you should be fine and if you were one of those people you probably wouldn't score high enough on the GRE to get into grad school anyway so if you're worried come talk to me but I doubt it will be a major issue 
lecture notes, as I said in the email, I always try to put a copy of Mon Sakai before class, and I'm trying to record audio and PowerPoint that I'll save after class. So like I said, if you're one of the, if you have lab work that you need to go to instead of class, or you just don't want to get up at 10 a.m. winter semester, and you want to listen to it at home, I am totally fine. I won't be offended. Last year, one of my best students came to class like twice the entire semester. And in terms of computer software, we've used R the past several years, and most people seem to be okay with that. I chose R for a couple reasons. Number one, it's becoming kind of the de facto platform of choice for a lot of particularly modern high-throughput genetics applications through the Bioconductor Project. If you do genetics at all, there's a good chance the R will be useful, and there's a number of other bench science type packages that make R useful. Second advantage is it's free. You don't have to mess with the computer lab or anything else. You can download it onto whatever computer you want. Run it any place you want. And third is just my own laziness, that it's what I use in my own work, so it's the package that I know far and away the best. That said, I mean, if you need to know how to do stuff in SAS or, or whatever platform, I try to make this as relevant as possible for the people in the class, so don't hesitate to let me know if you'd like to learn how to use something different, and I'll support you the best I can. There's will be a discussion section to help people learn R. There's also a short course at the Odom Institute in a couple weeks, as I mentioned in the email. Discussion section's optional. Historically, we get very few people coming to it, unless it's, there's a difficult homework assignment. Once again, we're fine with that. The discussion section's there to help you, and if you don't need it, then don't worry about it. But it will help us if you indicate on the course survey, if you think the discussion section is something you'd like to attend, the plan is I'm going to send out a doodle poll sometime soon to figure out the best time for the discussion section. If the people says, yes, I really want to go to this every week, then we'll make it a higher priority to work around your schedule. And I guess I should note in passing, I think there's some time on the course schedule for the discussion section, just completely ignore that. The only reason it's on there is to make some of the bureaucrats happy who said that we can't have a TA unless we specify a time for a discussion section in advance. So I said, okay, fine, I'll put a time on the schedule and then I'll just totally ignore it and do it at a time. So as for assignments, as noted on there, I think there will probably be about six homework assignments. I try not to make them too painful, but they're probably not going to be a walk in the park either. They'll pro most of them will involve reading and critiquing at least one paper in addition to writing some essays on some very statistical questions. My personal philosophy in this sort of thing is I try to encourage critical thinking and regurgitation and sort of emphasize the types of skills you would actually use in real life. I mean, I don't really care if you remember how to use a t-test. You can always look that up. What I care about is if you know when a t-test is appropriate to use, and if you can write a paragraph saying, I performed this analysis using this test and got these results as if you were writing a paper. That's the really important take-home message. So that's what you should expect to see assignments. And I also recognize in terms of how we struggled, just because, I mean, I know that Probably nobody in this class is a statistics major, and that your lab work should take priority over Biostatistics 610. I hate to tell somebody, okay, don't finish your experiment so that you can stay up all night getting your 610 homework done. So I try to be laid back with due dates, but I also like to re release solutions in a reasonably timely manner, and I can't do it or turning stuff in really late. So. This year I decided I'm going to try the carrot approach rather than the stick to help people get stuff turned in on time. If you turn it in before the assigned due date, I'm going to give a small bonus to the points. But 
you can turn it in up to a week late with no penalty. After a week late, what I ask is for you to email me and just explain why you haven't been able to turn it in and when you're going to be able to turn it in. I mean, traveling, if you've got lab work, family issues, I mean, I will be understanding. Last year, there was a woman who had a baby halfway through the semester, and I mean, it's like, what do you say? Congratulations about your son. Now hurry up and finish homework three. I mean, but... <laughs> I do ask that you just let me know because, once again, a couple of years ago, I mean, we had people turning in stuff like a month late, and that's just not great in terms of getting solutions posted in a reasonable point of time. And the plan right now is to do a take-home final. They haven't told me that I can't do that anymore, so I'm going to assume that I can. There was a whole big kerfluffle that if I give a take-home final, then maybe just purely hypothetically, a ton of football players could sign up for this class and we could end up in the national media about my no-show class or something like that. So, but I think I got authorization to still give the take-home final. And generally speaking, if you make an honest effort to do all the work, I'm not going to give you lower than a P, so don't stress too much. And I try to be fairly generous with the H's. In the past, everybody's worked really hard, so I've never really wanted to be evil when it comes to grades. And speaking of which, I'm supposed to include this blurb on the honor code. As they say, cheating's bad. Number one. Number two, you're in grad school. It's not like I'm going to fail you anyway. So if you cheat, it's like you run the risk and kicked out of school when I'm not going to give you lower than a P as it is. So don't cheat. And yeah, so far, I've never had any issues with that. And that's pretty much a semi-quick rundown on the syllabus. Any question about any organizational stuff in the course? Okay. Well, then I will proceed to today's lecture, which as it says, I'm just going to go over a quick list of things that you need to think about when conducting experiments, doing statistics in the biological sciences. And honestly, today's lecture may be one of the most important lectures, if not the most important of the semester. Because I said, I don't really care if you know how to use a test. Anyone can do that. What I care about is, can you design your experiment in such a way such that it gives you the results that you want to get? And can you critically read another paper, your own experiment, say, what are the limitations? What are the potential sources of bias and error in this experiment? If you forget how to do a t-test, it's easy enough to find someone to help you. But if your experiment gives you garbage results because of poor design, well, then you're dead in the water before you even start. I always start with this famous paper from Floss Medicine a couple of years ago by John Ioannidis, and I mean the title of the article says it all. The claim of the article was that the overwhelming majority of papers published in the biomedical literature are false for a variety of different reasons. And one of the major ones that he highlighted was just faulty statistical analysis. There was a follow-up article in the Wall Street Journal where it basically said that one of the single biggest reasons is people don't understand statistics or don't understand the various experimental design issues that can cause you to get misleading results in statistics. And as a result, people end up publishing false findings all the time. I've definitely seen some papers go out from my own research group that I'm almost certain are false, and there's a couple papers I've had my name attached to myself that I'm worried might be false. It's unfortunately difficult to avoid, but today I'm discuss some of the most common reasons why published research is false and how do we avoid publishing false research. So, here are some of the really common issues that arise, namely bias, outliers, not paying attention to the amount of measurement error. When you don't measure the correct thing, you choose the wrong controls, you ignore multiple testing, or you confound, or other issues along those lines. I will now briefly describe each of these over the course of the rest of today. So, bias 
you say a sample's biased if it's not representative of your population of interest, and biased samples, not surprisingly, can give you an accurate result. A couple examples of this, if there's been controversy in the news the past couple of years that you have various law schools saying, come to our law school, our average salary is over $100,000 per year. Does this mean that we should all quit science and go to law school, or is there some iffy numbers going on here? Well, there's a number of problems with these salary surveys. I'll go over some of the other ones later on, but... One of the major issues with these things is if you look at the fine print on these websites, oftentimes they say, this was based on a survey of people who actually took the time to fill out our salary survey, and only a small percentage of the class did it. And generally speaking, the people who are at a big corporate law firm earning $150,000 a year are much more likely to fill out the salary survey than those who are flipping burgers. And likewise, the school wants the best numbers possible. If they know somebody's working at a big corporate law firm, they're going to call and email them five times until they fill out a survey if they're flippers, mm, not so much. And the net result is you end up with a sample that's extremely non-representative of the overall population of interest, and you get overly optimistic numbers. Uh, an example that's perhaps more relevant to those of us working in the biomedical research field is that, say, you want to look at some biomarker, compare it to those, compare those who have a disease to those who haven't, who don't have a disease, and so I say, well, the simplest way to figure out, well, the simplest way to recruit people with this disease, let's go to the local hospital where people with the disease come in, and we'll recruit the people with the disease that way, but it's easy enough to peop recruit people without the disease, we'll just draw from the general population, and go from there. It, does that experimental design work? Did I, okay, now I guess this is just another example. I haven't gone to the next section yet. I mean, another issue that you can get in with bias, uh, famous examples if you look at prices of various assets. The, there were people who bought tech stocks in the late 90s or people who bought houses in the mid-2000s and expected they would get rich really quickly that way. And, well, most of you are probably aware that did not exactly happen. And the point is that just because you see a certain trend in your data doesn't mean that trend is likely to continue over time. If you're only looking at a particular set of time points, that may not be representative of all of history going forward. So, points to remember in terms of bias, if your, if your sample isn't representative of the population, your statistic can be completely meaningless, and you want to make sure that your sample is representative or as representative as possible. I mean, as I said, the only way to get a truly representative sample in most cases for studying humans is just stick all the people in the world into a jar and randomly pull a hundred out. And obviously, you're never going to have the money to do that. So you just have to try to say, well, this is the sample that we're drawing from. We think it's representative of our true sample or not representative because X, Y, or Z. Another thing that can screw up your scientific results is outliers. An outlier is an observation that's kind of extreme compared to the rest of the data. As you can see on this slide here, the two data points at the far right, the outliers, they're much larger than any of the other values. And they're important for a variety of reasons, one of which is that the most commonly reported statistics in papers, namely means and standard deviations, are not resistant to outlaw. Oh, going back to our issue of salaries of law graduates, so the school reports that their average salary was over $100,000 per year. Well, if one-third of their graduates were earning 200000 per year and the other two-thirds were earning 50000 per year, that still gives you an average 
of 100,000, and hence the average figure would be meeting. This is a really common problem with like salary surveys in particular, that quite often there will be a very small subset of the people who are earning far more than everyone else. That tends to increase your average. And this is a study on the starting salary distribution of lawyers, and we see that is exactly what's happening. There is some very small subset who get ridiculously high starting salaries. The vast majority, though, are much lower, so you end up with even a median salary of around 65000 The median is less resistant to outliers than the mean. The mean would probably be closer to down there or the mean would be higher, rather. Sorry, I obviously didn't sleep enough last night, but you see my point. So, you just get one or two bad data points, and it can completely throw off your entire study. So, we'll discuss this in more detail later in the course, but you should always check for outliers before you perform statistical analysis, and if you find outliers, you should decide what to do with them. And like I said, I'll discuss that in more detail. This actually turns out to be a really hard problem because if an outlier is a real number and you get rid of it, that can also get you into trouble. I mean, on the subject of housing price, that when they built like these big securities of subprime mortgages that you may have read about, they built these models predicting how much housing prices could fall at once. And they said, oh, you know, the case where all these people default on their mortgages at the same time due to dropping prices, and that's such a rare event that we're just going to ignore it because it would never happen in real life. And, well, ignoring that supposedly extremely rare case turned out to cause major problems. I mean, another issue that you can get into in statistics that seems obvious but is often overlooked is measurement error, that any time you measure anything or calculate any sort of statistic, it's going to have a certain amount of error associated with it, and you need to keep this error in mind when you interpret. I mean, kind of a silly example, but sort of illustrates it, is once upon a time way back in the day, Reader's Digest did a study showing the amount of nicotine and tar in each brand of cigarettes. And basically, there was no meaningful difference between any of the different types of cigarettes. They were about the same, but Old Gold had, was lower than the other brands by just a hair. I mean, if you draw, drew like the confidence intervals, which if you don't know what they are, we'll discuss their, them in all their glory. If you drew the confidence intervals, they all overlapped, but Old Gold was still the lowest. So Old Gold decided to take this and run an advertising campaign saying that they had the lowest amount of nicotine in their cigarettes. And, I mean, well, Obviously, that's just corporate America, particularly the tobacco industry, being evil. Nobody who's a reputable scientist would actually be that stupid, would they? Well, actually, a common place where people get into trouble with this is in things like genome-wide association studies. If you're not familiar with the technology, it's typically you look at like a million single nucleotide polymorphisms, try to see if any of these polymorphisms are associated with the disease. And one study I read, this was prostate cancer, and they identify the 10 most significant SNPs. And not surprisingly, a couple of these SNPs turned out to have huge odds ratios for the association with prostate cancers. That means if you have one of these particular genetic markers that you're extremely likely to get prostate cancer, not exactly. I mean, anytime you may estimate anything, there's an error associated with it. And as a result of that error, sometimes you're going to underestimate things, sometimes you're going to overestimate things. And when you estimate a million things, you, in some cases, you are going to badly underestimate things or badly overestimate things. And it's maybe one time in a million you're going to estimate an odds ratio that's a hundred times larger than it really is. And, well, if you look at a million markers, one time in a million is expected to happen about once. 
So, in this type of study, the SNPs most strongly associated with disease are most likely to be the SNPs that were that got that were lucky in a certain sense that just by random chance were much more strongly associated with the disease than they would be in the overall population. So they tried to do a repl replication of this particular study and the odds ratios for the replication study were much smaller than they were in the first study. In fact, in many cases, they were very close to one, illustrating that in science as well, we have to pay attention to the measurement error and think about how it affects results. Um, yeah, I think I just basically said everything that was on this slide that we need to keep in mind measurement error, particularly when we're doing multiple tasks. And another place that you can get into trouble with experimental design is when you measure the wrong variable. Sometimes we can't measure, directly measure a variable of interest, so we measure a different variable that's believed to provide the same information. And I mean, this isn't necessarily a bad thing that if we want to see does inhaling tobacco smoke cause lung cancer, your IRB is going to let you stick a baby in a room and fill it full of cigarette smoke and see if they develop cancer in 20 years, thankfully. The only way that you could do that is in some sort of an animal model. But there's always the question of whether the animal model will generalize to humans. So, I mean, I'm not saying if you measure a variable that's not your direct variable of interest that it's necessarily flawed science, but you need to keep that in mind and recognize this is a limitation when you write your results. That... An example of this in survey sampling is drug use if you try to figure out the proportion of people who use illegal drugs. If you just call up a bunch of people and say, do you use drugs, you will get some number, and that number is likely to be wrong if people lie. And, I mean, this depends heavily on your experimental design. Well, it's likely to be even more wrong if this survey is performed face-to-face -face by a law enforcement officer, for instance, than if you do it over the phone. But even if you do it over the phone, people quite frequently won't tell the truth. They've done studies, and one way that you can get around this is you tell people in the phone survey, okay, go get a coin, flip the coin if it lands heads, and you've never used illegal drugs, say no, otherwise say yes. So that if somebody says yes, there's no way the experimenter will know whether they've actually used drugs or if the coin just landed tails, and then you can make an estimate from that. When you do it that way, suddenly the per estimated percentage of people who have used drugs becomes much higher. And another issue that's closer to the bench science world is animal models that people often do experiments on rats or something like that to and hope the results generalize to humans, but sometimes they don't. I mean, again, hopefully this is obvious, but it's the sort of thing that you have to keep in mind when you design an experiment that a particular animal model or a particular model organism will not necessarily generalize to the world as a whole. And again, like I say, measuring these types of indirect measurements are often a necessary evil, but you want to try to verify as best as you can that what you're measuring is a good surrogate for what you can't directly measure, and acknowledge this as a limitation when you write up your results. And another place where people get into trouble in science is if they don't include controls in their experiment or if they include inadequate controls. Hopefully most of you are aware controls are just sort of a baseline that if you're comparing sick people to healthy people, the controls will be your healthy people. Or if you're comparing a drug 
to a placebo, the people getting the placebo would be your controls. If you don't include controls in your experiment or you choose inadequate controls, you can get into that. To give an extreme example of where this can get messed up, there was once a procedure called the port cable shunt. I don't even know if that's how you pronounce it, and I don't know if they still do this, but basically, if in case of cirrhosis of the liver, people can start hemorrhaging and potentially bleed to death, and you can try to get around, prevent that by doing this procedure called a port cable shunt, but this there is no walk in the park, and if you don't do it correctly, you can end up causing serious problems to the patients even with the procedure, so the question becomes, do the benefits outweigh the risks? And back in the day, this was studied fairly extensively. There were some 36 different studies that looked at the port cable shunt and tried to indicate whether or not they thought it was a good idea. And as you can see here, many of these studies didn't include controls. They just were basically case studies. They looked at a certain number of patients who had received the shunt and looked at the outcomes like, hey, this person was really sick. We did, or this group of 15 people were all really sick. We did the shunt. Ten of them survived. We think this is a fantastic idea. Most of the studies were fairly enthusiastic. They only looked at people who got the procedure. The Only a small set of studies actually compared people who got the procedure to controls who didn't get the procedure and they generally found that the risks of performing this operation were greater than the benefits, and hence the enthusiasm was low in most of the studies with controls. Another place where you can get into trouble is if you have bad controls, and this actually happened in a study that I worked on in my center. We study chronic pain, in particular fibromyalgia, and so <coughs> we got this data from Pfizer. It wasn't my group who messed this up, but basically they got their fibromyalgia cases and genotyped them all from one particular study site. Then the control samples were collected from a bunch of other different studies and genotyped at another location. And I was completely oblivious to this when I did the statistical analysis. So I did the analysis, found a set of like five genes that were just overwhelmingly associated with fibromyalgia that people who had all of the genes had almost 100% risk of fibromyalgia. And I got super excited. It's like, I've discovered the genes that cause fibromyalgia and was having visions of being on the front page of the New England Journal or something like that. And that's what I found out about their experimental design. I discovered I had found five genes that indicated very strongly whether you were genotyped at facility A or facility B, which was kind of depressing. But the point is, if there's some systematic difference between your cases and controls that don't have anything to do with the disease, that's also going to mess you up. That you want your controls to be as similar as possible to your cases, with the exception of the treatment or the disease or what the case may be. And yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself on these slides. Again, you need to include controls in your experiment. That's the most basic thing. And you also want your controls to be as similar as possible to the treatment population. Another place where you can get into trouble is multiple hypothesis testing, which is becoming more and more common, particularly in modern bioscience, that when... We'll discuss hypothesis testing in much more detail later in this course. But typically, when you do hypothesis testing, you compute a p-value. Most of you have probably seen this before. The p-value is kind of the probability of observing something as extreme or more extreme as you observed, given that there's no difference between the treatment and control groups, for example. And by convention, you reject your null hypothesis of no difference between the groups if your p-value is less than 0.05. Well, 5% of the time, you're going to get p less than 0.05 just because you got unlucky. And if you're only looking at one hypothesis test at a time, that may be no big deal. 
But if you're doing multiple hypothesis tests, then that becomes a bit heavier. A famous example of this was a study of schizophrenia back in the day, where researchers gave a psychological questionnaire with 100 questions to schizophrenia patients and matched controls who are otherwise similar. And for four of the questions on this particular survey, there were differences between the schizophrenia patients and the controls at the P less than 0.05 level. The researchers immediately wrote up their results and ran off and published it. And hopefully you can already see the problem here. But when you test multiple hypotheses, this P less than 0.05 criteria isn't necessarily enough to avoid false positives. If you perform 100 tests, you would expect about five of them to be have P less than 0.05 just by chance. The fact they saw four was not all that impressive, and indeed, these results were never reproduced. And if you do modern genetics at all in the modern bioscience world, this is looking at microarrays with tens of thousands of genes or genome-wide association studies with up to millions of markers or today we're getting to be doing next generation sequencing with millions and potentially soon even billions of tests then there's a huge danger of finding false positives due to chance and I'll discuss some of the issues the, or some of the steps you can take to deal with that later on in this course but it's something to keep in mind and even if you only do a single test you have to ask yourself how confident you are that P equals 0.047 is really significant, particularly if it's uh, saying, if it's really going against conventional wisdom that cigarettes don't cause lung cancer or something like that. Another major problem in experimental design that gets overlooked a lot is confounding, which basically when you do an experiment, oftentimes you want to say A causes B or A is associated with B. Confounding means there's some other variable C that's associated with both A and B, so you don't know if A is associated with B at all or if it's just C causing both A and B. I'll give a few examples of that on the upcoming and well, this is kind of a silly example, and unfortunately it's hard to see here, but it just illustrates that just because two things happen and are associated with one another, it does not mean that one is causing the other. Top left corner here, the black line is the number of Facebook users, the yellow line is the interest rates on Greek debt. So the caption at the top, did Facebook cause the Greek debt crisis? Or this year, it's like, if people started reading newspapers, would M. Night Shamanoff start making good movies again? The black line is the circulation of newspapers that's fallen off the last few years. The yellow line is the rating on Rotten Tomatoes of M. Night Shamanoff's movie. You have close to 90% for the sixth sense, and then 6% for the last airbender. Or down here you have, is the Mur is this mountain range cause murder rate in New York City? The yellow line is the murder rate in New York City in the mountains. Um, it's kind of ridiculous, but it sort of illustrates the point that just because you see two things moving together at the same time doesn't mean that one's causing the other. Another example of this is shoe size. There was a study once that found that children with larger shoe sizes did better on achievement tests. The researchers ended up scratching their heads for a while. They figured out that older children tend to do better on tests and have larger shoe sizes, and that explained the entire result. Or another example that I saw was an editorial published in some newspaper in California where they were saying that the schools that have the most money per student consistently have the worst test scores. He said, this proof that we're just wasting money giving it all to the teachers' unions, increase money for public education, and it doesn't do anything. Well, you dive into the data a little bit more closely, you notice that the schools that got the most money, 
tended to be the schools that either had a lot of kids in special ed or a lot of kids, a lot of ESL students, kids who didn't speak English. So, not surprisingly, these schools, they didn't do as well on achievement tests, but it wasn't caused by the money or lack of money, it was caused by these other factors. Or another study that I was involved with to illustrate that this can happen in the bench science world as well, and that I managed to mess up once again by, in this case, was just not being told about the experimental design. We were looking for genes that were associated with the risk of developing arthritis or the severity of arthritis, and we genotyped 3,000 patients. And we looked to see if patients with arthritis differed from those without arthritis. And once again, I found a bunch of genetic markers that were highly significant and got really excited before somebody explained to me the details of the experimental design. That what had happened in this case is unbeknownst to me that it was a mixed race sample that included a large number of African Americans. African Americans being more likely to develop arthritis, and they also have some genetic markers that differ systematically from Caucasians. So once again, I found a long list of genes that didn't tell you that you were more likely to develop arthritis. They indicated what your skin color was most likely to be. So this is a problem in the bench science world as well. And confounding is a tricky issue because it's not a sort of thing that you can just perform some sort of simple test and see is there likely confounding going on in this particular experiment. You just have to rely on common sense. You just have to think about your results and say, is there possibly some lurking variable that's leading to the association between my two variables, and a lot of times it's really difficult to know for sure. I'm hopefully going to drill this into your head enough over the course of the semester that you will be good statisticians and try to see confounding any time you see any sort of association that try to understand, is there possibly some other variable that's causing the association? And one of the last things that can get you into trouble and really one of the most nefarious is what I call torturing the data. The fame comes from a famous quote from Ronald Coase where he said, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess that there's this, and you've probably all been in science long enough to know that there's this publisher parish mindset in science that if getting a paper in nature or whatever can make or break somebody's career, it creates a really strong incentive to try to bend your analysis to get what you want. Some researchers tend to tailor their analysis to get the result they want rather than trying to find the most appropriate test for their particular data. And I always like to think of this particular Far Side comic when I think of this, the, I mean, you can see here, it's like, why do we see that goat on top of this cloud bank? Obviously, they're not going toward a cloud bank, but actually the side of the mountain. And as I said, there's, in academia or industry or anywhere else, oftentimes there is a very strong pressure to get a particular result in your experiment. And if you spend tons of money on an experiment and don't get the results that you want, it can be devastating to a person's career, so a lot of times there is very strong pressure to cut a corners, and I have definitely been in meetings where collaborators were ready to chop my head off when I gave them the results that they wanted, but this sort of thinking can get you into trouble in the long run. I mean, two famous examples, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember Fleshman and Pons, the whole cold fusion debacle, that basically they thought they saw a cold fusion in their data and ran and told the media before it was ever published. A more recent example was Mark Hauser, who studied primate behavior. Basically what it boiled down to is he claimed that he saw some 
he saw things on the videos of his monkeys that his research assistants and others who viewed the tapes said that they weren't there and ended up losing his job at Harvard and things like that. So, big take-home message, try to do rigorous statistics, view your own data critically and see what the problems are rather than go out and publish results that are potentially false. And I'm out of time, so does anybody have any questions about any of this? Okay, one other blurb that I forgot to make earlier in the class is that if you are not registered, please try to register as quickly as possible, and if you're auditing, that's fine. But please fill out the audit form just because, well, basically, if one or two more people register, we get a second TA, so please register. It will make me happy. And otherwise, I will see everybody on Friday.